I got a question about the book of Jude, verse 22 through 23. How would they apply this to themselves when it comes to soul winning? So look at Jude 22 and 23. It says, And of some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. So the question has to do with, do you have compassion on some people and make a difference? And then other people you save with fear. While you may approach people differently, the gospel message will always remain the same. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, it gives you the clear, simple gospel. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. We still preach that Jesus Christ died on the cross. He died by shedding His blood. He was buried and resurrected. Also that the penalty for dying in your sins is eternal hell. And that's the message you'll give to every person. Regardless of how you approach the person, that's the message you'll give every one of them. So Jude 22 and 23 says, Of some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Practically, you could say that some sinners respond better to a sweet warning of the same gospel message from uh, a soft-spoken person than they do a hard preacher who, who's considered a hellfire preacher that scares them to death. Some people respond better to different ways. Not just limit, limiting this to salvation, you could also use this for a Christian who's living in sin. If you warn them, you save them from being a bad testimony or from cutting their life short. Fear is a good thing. The fear of the Lord keeps you from doing things that can ruin your life. And some people respond better to a warning from somebody who is very soft-spoken and sweet. Some people respond better to somebody like just an old-school hellfire preacher or something. Some people need to be scared to death before they will make the right decision. And the reason men get overly wicked is because they don't fear God. So sometimes you really have to make them fear God. Show them what the Bible says, the consequences of their actions, the consequences of rejecting Jesus Christ. Romans 3.18 talks about men with no fear of God before their eyes. Maybe they've heard so many TV preachers and uh, money-hungry preachers that they don't even realize how fearful it is to fall into the hands of the living God because God is a consuming fire. Maybe they don't realize all these things. That's a bad condition to get into. When you think that you're so great that not even God can knock you off your throne, you're in some very rough shape. So sometimes you have to save with fear, pulling them out of the fire because they won't respond to being sweet and soft-spoken and gentle. But on the other hand, some people do. Hebrews eleven seven says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. So you see, Noah, he was moved with fear. And I don't think Noah was uh, a hard person to crack. But God still used a uh, fear and it caused him to prepare an ark. So there's always going to be a little bit of fear involved. I don't care who the person is. For example, most of us got saved because we feared going to hell. And there's nothing wrong with that. And Job 1.1 it says, There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Luke 12, 5 says, But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, 
fear him. You know, we're all supposed to fear God. Proverbs 16, 6, By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Fear is a good thing. You might approach people differently according to their personality, according to their age when you're witnessing to them, but the message should remain the same. Forewarn them about their sin and where it's going to take them. We know that a sinner who doesn't get saved goes to hell. I believe we tell every person that, no matter who they are. You can't say the gospel without mentioning sin. Why wouldn't you tell them that the penalty for rejecting Jesus Christ is eternal death in the lake of fire? The Bible says it, so why leave it out? I believe every person needs that warning, no matter who they are. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the person who sent this email asked me a lot about witnessing to the lost people at his workplace. He's a bit worried that he is seen as the cool Christian, so he is afraid of coming off worldly to people. Now, while you're given the gospel message, which is a very negative message about their sin, and you know you're telling them that that sin's going to take them to hell, you don't have to be mean or rude or stuck up to keep from being worldly. Um, being a Christian does not mean being rude and a smart aleck. I've been working with someone for about an hour that I hadn't ever met, and they say, I, I notice you don't cuss. And they say, I hope my cussing doesn't bother you. And then when they say something like that, right there is your door. Uh, to tell them the truth of the gospel, that's your door when they say things like this. I'm not going to tell the person to stop cussing. What I'm going to say is something like, yeah, I try my best not to cuss ever since I was saved. And then I give them a short testimony. And most times lost people give you the, the door to say something. But sometimes you can make the door yourself. Many times I'll just flat out ask the person if they're a Christian. And most people say, yes, I'm a Christian. That's the answer you get from most people. So I say, okay, that's, that's great. When did you get saved? And that takes it a step further. That's where most people, they start to get confused and they give you that uncomfortable look that you know of. If you've witnessed to people in your life, they give you that uncomfortable look. And they might give you an age that they got baptized or something, but most people really don't even know what salvation is. So then my next question is pretty straightforward, and that is, what do you believe saves a person? And if they say anything other than believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, I don't start being a smart aleck and criticize them. I simply tell them my testimony, how I got saved. And I tell them that you're saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I give them the clear plan of salvation from the Bible. That way they know the clear plan of salvation. And they're not just going through life thinking, Salvation has to do with water baptism and all these other things. What I never do is go around and tell people not to do certain sins. I mean, why, there's some Christians who go to their workplace and they're correcting lost people all day, telling them they shouldn't do this, they shouldn't do that. Um, your main concern with a lost person isn't getting them to quit drinking and quit cussing. It's for them to get saved. So it's none of my business what they do, and my concern isn't with getting a lost person to quit a certain sin. It's not my job to clean up a lost person's mouth. How do you, how do you even clean up a lost person's mouth? That really doesn't even make sense to me. My job is to give him the gospel, and hopefully he will believe, and then the Lord will clean up his mouth. I'm not going to cuss with them. I'm not going to laugh at their dirty jokes. But I believe a man should be able to say what he wants to say, even if I don't agree with it. Even if I think that it's filthy. He has a freedom of speech. I want my freedom of speech. If I can stop them from cussing, then someone can stop me from saying the words of God. So, the answer to that question is, I don't go around telling people what to do, what to say, and what not to say. It's really none of my business. Another question is, if a Christian never leads a soul to Jesus Christ, even if he is consistently witnessing, will God still recognize it? 
I believe the answer is a yes. Because you have to take into account that some places just aren't as receptive as other places. Even some neighborhoods in a town aren't as recepted, receptive as another neighborhood. Our responsibility is to give the gospel out. Even in the Old Testament, you see the example of Noah preaching for 120 years and he only had eight people on the ark. And that was his family. Consider Jeremiah. He didn't have much results. Nothing you do for the Lord is in vain. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, it says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Anything that you're doing for the Lord from the heart, it's not in vain. Every time you're giving the gospel, you are putting the word in someone's heart so that they can believe on Jesus Christ later if they don't then. For example, my grandmother gave me the gospel. Later, I believed the gospel. I already had it in my heart. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I didn't hear the gospel the night that I got saved, but I had already heard it and knew it. So even if a person doesn't get saved the moment you give them the gospel, you still put that in them to where they could believe on it later. What about people who try to argue with you while soul winning, someone asks. Once again, our responsibility is to give the gospel. It's not to straighten everyone out. I can't straighten them out, and I'm not smart enough to straighten everybody out. Only God can do that. I can try to show them the way of God more perfectly, but to sit and argue is a waste of time, and a lot of times lost people are smarter than you on things, and um, even though you have the truth and they have an error, Sometimes they know their error, their bad stuff that they know, more than you know the good stuff that you know. So unless you really know what you're talking about, I wouldn't even try to debate somebody. I would give them the gospel and just let the Lord do with it what he needs to do. I can't debate people. I'm not, I'm not good at debating and arguing and winning verbal uh, fights like that. Or just ver verbally, I'm not good like that. So I don't even try to debate people. I give them that my responsibility is to give them the truth. And then it becomes their responsibility, responsibility what they do with the truth. So how can you be effective so winning? I personally believe winning the respect of co-workers and family and lost people that you come in contact with is a key. And that has to do with not being a smart aleck, not being mean, not being rude. They need to see you as someone who is honest, someone who doesn't cuss with them and laugh at their dirty jokes with them and doesn't drink with them. That's what I would consider being a cool, the, the cool Christian. I wouldn't consider that cool, but what the lost world might consider cool is pretty much going along with everything that they do. And that's not showing the world what a true Christian is and they're not going to see you as someone that they respect going along with everything that they're doing this stuff is going to make them not take you serious you give them the gospel and you work side by side with them and then a relationship is built there now I'm not saying you wait on giving them the gospel you give them I give you give people the gospel right away you show them what you stand for. Then you build a relationship with that person. And sometimes things happen over time and not just in a few minutes. And they see you as someone who is different than they are. They shouldn't think that you are just like them. God wants us to be a peculiar people. When it comes to witnessing to just random people, you just have to be pretty straightforward with it. Because... You really don't have time to build up any type of relationship with a random person like you do in the workplace. I don't have time to get to know every person. So you just flat out ask the person, are you a Christian? If they say yes, then you take it a step further and say, that's great, how long have you been saved? If they say about five years or something like that, then I take it a step further and say, what do you believe saves a person? And you'll find that most people like I said, don't know what being saved is, and they're just telling you that they're saved to get out of this awkward situation. 
Another thing you need to realize is you don't really need to do this in a crowd. Like if you're, you do it one-on-one -on -one because the person won't respond in a crowd like he would one-on-one. -on -one. So you wait until you can have a private conversation with him. If you have ever done any witnessing, then you know it already makes the person extremely uncomfortable anyways. You can tell by the look on their face. You don't want to just come up to a guy standing next to all of his friends and say, have you ever been saved? Unless you're talking to all of the people. If you're going to approach an individual, then in my opinion, it's best to go to them one-on-one -on -one if you can. And when it comes to knocking on someone's door, from my personal experience, everyone just tells you that you are, that they're, they'll just tell you that they're saved and they try to get rid of you. And I've had more people tell me that they're saved than to tell me that they're not saved. I rarely get people telling me that they're lost. If they insist that they're saved, I'll just give them the gospel anyway. Because for all I know, they are just like all the other people who lied to me to get rid of me. I'll just say, can I share these verses with you? And they mostly say yes because they don't want to be rude. And I just simply go through the gospel with them and explain to them that they are a sinner. Jesus shed his blood for their sin. The consequence is hell. That way, if they really aren't saved, I've given them the gospel. And I may not be so winning. They may not bow their head there and get saved. But I did some soul warning. The responsibility is off my hands. I've given them the gospel. And 1 Corinthians uh, 3, 5 through 7 says, Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So that then neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. God may use you to give someone the gospel. And let her use someone else to lead them to the Lord. He used both of you, and you both had a hand in it. I think a lot of times people pride themselves on how many they have led to the Lord compared to others, but you have to remember God is taking other things into account. We also shouldn't think we're pleasing the Lord more based on how many souls that we actually led to the Lord or how many times we read the Bible a year or anything like that. You please the Lord by doing everything to the glory of God. So remember, it's not about quantity it's about quality